You started this shit, man. Can't say nothing to me. <laughs> Look, this uh, this whole bin chicken thing has kind of got an, gotten out of hand, uh, as you can as you can tell by Mister Asama Bin Chicken, who's currently in the chat. Dear Lord, uh, does that mean work. that they're going to have to start choking all the bin chickens? Oh my God, I don't know. <laughs> great work on that AVI, though. By the way, that is a fantastic Thank you. picture. Try that. Awesome, awesome. Mr. Ryan Christensen, welcome. Thank you very much. It's Thank good to be you. here. Thank you so much for joining me, man. It's um, so it's it's I've kind of titled this conversation uh, two ways because those are the two directions I want to head with our, with our chat today, uh, and I, yeah. I would love to pick your brain about two things. One being your experience in the BDSM lifestyle. And the other being your your work, what you do for a living. Uh, awesome. Hypnotizing men and making them better men. Yes. So. And hypnotizing women and making them better women. Well, wow, that too. That ties back into the BDSM stuff. So, yes, it does. <laughs> uh, for, for anyone who is not familiar with you, maybe give you, give a brief introduction as to your background and, uh, and, and, and also sort of what you do professionally. Sure, sure. Uh, so my name is Ryan Christensen. My website is hypnosisformen.net. My job these days is to help men become better men, get themselves the hell out of their way so they can live the lives that they want to live. Get rid of all the limiting beliefs, all those limiting, uh, you know, habits and stuff that we build up over time that keep us from getting the things in life that we truly want. Uh, I'm a 23 year veteran of the intelligence community. I spent five years in the Marine Corps, another six years with the Air National Guard, was doing the government contracting theory here in the DC metropolitan area for about 16 years. Uh, did counterterrorism, did counterproliferation, did the international globe trotting man of mystery thing for a while, which was a lot of fun, also really exhausting. Um, moved out here to DC in 2004, got involved in the BDSM scene at, at that point in time. So I'm about 16 years in, more or less. Most of that in the public scene, which is very different from doing it in private. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Also spent a good bit of time during that time in the swinging scene. Um, a lot of my partners and I did some swinging. It was a lot of fun. Threw some orgies, went to some orgies. That's a great old time. I uh, got interested in hypnosis uh, quite a while back and then more interested in it more seriously last year as part of uh, Jonathan from Modern Life Dating's uh, Body Language Mastery course. I got in quarter three of 2019, uh, got interested in hypnosis. Uh, at that point in time, one of the other guys in the group was a hypnotist, did some work with me, blew my mind. And at that point in time, I was really trying to figure out what I wanted to do next because the intel thing was getting kind of old. It was time to ready to do the next big thing, right? I uh, thought about doing psychology, realized I was going to have to do five or six years of school before I could start my life, my, my actual professional career. And doing that at 50 did not sound like a fun plan. Uh, hypnosis was a lot more accessible. Started doing that, realized I was actually pretty good at it. Started up a business doing it earlier this year. And now that's my full-time job. I left my old career behind early October, and this is now me doing this full-time. Congratulations, sir. Thank you. Well-deserved. Well-deserved uh, career, career switch. So I've seen, I've because uh, uh, we're both uh, generals in mm -hmm. Hot Dude uh, Army. Army, and we, exactly. I've, I've seen the results that Ryan has given guys, and it's fantastic. Like, there's a lot of transformation going on behind yep. Doors. You know, that's one thing that's uh, fascinating about the whole modern life dating body language mastery thing is it's like come for the come for the sex, come for the pickup, come for the uh, the, the online dating, stay for the total transformation of your life as a man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> get fitter, get healthier, get wealthier. Uh, yeah, okay. and yeah. get laid. And as a side, as a byproduct, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's kind of strange how that works, but it's uh, it's one hundred percent true. So Why I, I'm not really that surprised with it because like all. All of life's problems come from either like health, wealth, or relationships, right? And if yes. you and it's hard to always balance all three of those things simultaneously, or to yeah. even like try to improve all three of those thing, things simultaneously. But what you'll notice is that if you're lacking in one area, like it's sort of like the the, the what's the word I'm looking for the the underlying angst you feel will yep. trickle into other areas of your life so it's like yes. your, your biology is a man telling you to get your shit sorted out yes because yes, like 100 yes you know if you can't it's like survival and reproduction right if you can't like mm -hmm. feed yourself aka wealth you're gonna mm -hmm. die if you're if you're decrepit and you, you're not healthy you're gonna die if you can't mm -hmm. get laid you're not gonna pass your genes on simple yep. like it, it Boils it down and really. Not, not to mention the fact that if you're not having sex and enjoying your life, you might as well die. 
Yeah. I mean, like, <laughs> let's just be honest, right? <laughs> there's not much point. There's, there's, there's the things that we, we that bring us like fulfillment and, and well, not they're two separate things. The things that get, bring us fulfillment, the things that bring us joy, they're pretty like basic when you get down to yeah. it. Become yeah. pretty basic drives. You know what's kind of funny is that the fact that you you're you know ex um, ex services right mm -hmm. intelligence military it was it was a branch of the military right yeah Marine Corps for Marine five Corps. years uh, Air Air National Guard for another six which is like the Air Force Reserves more or less and then contracting is Intel for like sixteen right I it's so maybe this isn't that weird but like I think ninety percent of the professional like of the doms that I know. So guys who are either mm -hmm. professional doms, either in my industry, or they've worked professionally as a dom at some point, or they are genuine long-term lifestyle doms, 90% mm -hmm. of them come from the armed forces. That doesn't surprise me at all. And there's a lot of different reasons for that. I think the most obvious one is that whole having lived a life of discipline for a while, right? Mm. In that you get used to that idea of having structure in your life. You get you get exposed very quickly, very easily, and very directly with all kinds of principles of leadership and all kinds of different levels of stress, right? Mm. Whether that's not even just combat stress, even the peacetime stuff can be incredibly stressful and incredibly complicated and incredibly dangerous, right? So when you start learning how to lead at a very young age by being put in these situations where you have to take responsibility for other people's lives, that kind of becomes a way of life mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, right? So it's very easy to translate that to the rest of your life. And oh, by the way, once you're in the military and you feel what competent leadership looks like, and you can tell what incompetent leadership looks like, because there's a lot of that shit in the military too, let's be honest, <laughs> right? It's not all sun and games, it's not all, not all roses. Um, but once you learn to just differentiate, you have very low tolerance for bad leadership, mm -hmm. right? And you have very little tolerance for putting your life and your livelihood and your well-being in the hands of somebody who can't lead you well. Which means that you're very unlikely to submit your life to somebody who can't handle it, right? The other interesting thing that Siren Demare mentioned in her uh, your, her interview with you, was it two nights ago? I think it was Wednesday night, yeah. right? Tuesday night, right? She mentioned like, oh, if you want to be a good dom, well, you have to submit first. Well... I, I did 13 weeks in a 24 seven DS relationship with four big ass dudes. It's called Marine Corps boot camp. <laughs> where every part of my life was regimented. They told me what to do, fucking how to wear. They told me how to fucking dress, how to tie my shoes, how to do everything. Right. Mm -hmm. And when you have to just let go and subsume your ego and just let shit happen and just understand that you're just making it minute to minute to minute, you understand what it's like to put yourself in somebody else's hands what it's like to just let somebody else lead you through a process, even if you don't understand the whys at each particular minute, mm -hmm. that in the end, there's a purpose. In the end, there is a goal and that they understand the process that they're taking you through, right? You, you have just connected two things that I was going to ask so beautifully. So I, when Cyrus, so for those of you who, haven't, who didn't watch the interview yet, I, if you're going to watch this entire episode, you should also watch the episode I did two shows ago with Siren Demare, who is a is a porn star. She's a MILF porn star, but she's been a professional uh, submissive, basically, uh, in mm -hmm. the BDSM scene for quite a while. So she's got a lot of experience on the opposite end. And she said something during the interview, which which I didn't really agree with at the time when she said it, which was what you just said then, Ryan, which was mm -hmm. to, be a, to, to be a good dominant, you have to have, you have to have experience as a submissive. And I was taking her quite literally in the sense of in the BDSM scene. But what you've just explained makes so much it's connecting a lot of dots for me in my mind right now where i'm like i said that pattern i'm seeing of dudes who've been in the army end up becoming doms mm -hmm. right in the BDSM scene. this is making a lot of sense because they've by default been in this submissive kind of relationship with their army boot camp instructors Yes, in a very real way, in a very real way. And they've also had to put themselves, you know, when you're in the military, essentially you're signing up to when the guy above me says do X, I just do X. Yeah. Even yeah. if it doesn't make sense, even if it's personally dangerous to me, I do X because there's a reason for it. There's a greater good. I have put my faith in them to have my best interest at heart or to at least have the mission at their heart, right? 
They're uh, doing this for a reason. There's a purpose behind it, right? So you have to have that inherent trust at all times, yeah. right? Uh, quick shout out to Afi Kingdom. Thank you so much, sir, for the super chat. Awesome. Welcome back to the chat. Good to see you again, buddy. He's so, an amazing guy. Amazing guy. Amazing but guy. I would good. say yeah. one thing that, um, you know, Siren does say that, you know, you have to do that. You have to have the submissive role. And there's actually a big part of the BDSM scene that says that you should also be submissive in the BDSM, BDSM sense to be a dominant. Hmm. I disagree with that. And there's a lot of reasons why. Number one, I don't feel like you have to be a slave in order to be a master. You don't have to do that, right? They're two very different roles. Mm. Learning how to be a good follower does not make you a good leader. Learning how to follow helps you understand how to lead better, right? But you don't have to be a slave in order to be a master. The other thing is that there's a lot of situations where less than scrupulous tops, less than scrupulous dominance, you know, less than scrupulous people who are in positions of power within the BDSM scene will use that as a line or as an excuse to get women who would not otherwise be interested in submitting to them hmm. to do so so that they can have the joy of breaking them and making them their slave and fucking them and everything else. Right? right. So there's a very sleazy part of the scene that doesn't get talked about nearly enough, especially in the public scene of more predatory types who will use that as a way to get people to be in submissive positions that they would not otherwise allow themselves to be. So how, so. how exactly do they do that? If the girls aren't, sort of already opened the idea. Well, if you're coming in the BDSM scene and you don't really know a lot about it, a lot of times you're there to learn, right? right. A lot of girls will have like open classes and things like that where people who know their stuff will be talking about, you know, how to do BDSM, what BDSM is all about, what dominance is all about, how to lead and all that other good stuff, right? Techniques on how to use a flogger, how to use canes, how to use paddles, how to tie people up safely, right? There's this whole education aspect that needs to be done so that people can actually do this safely and well. Yes. A lot of these okay. people are in positions of authority. And if you have a person who's in a position of authority talking to somebody who's new, who doesn't know, who's there to learn, who's trying to there to explore, it's very easy for them to use that lack of knowledge mm. against them. You know what I mean? Okay. Now this, now this is sort of clarifying. Again, this is sort of clarifying uh, mm -hmm. a point I raised with Siren in which she was saying that I get she sort of is uh, echoing the point you're making here where sometimes in the BDSM scene you'll get people who will take advantage of the, of the submissives physically mm -hmm. or mentally in the relationship um, absolutely yeah and this is this is kind of explaining it so <clears throat> you mentioned before how uh, when you were in a, in a position in the army where you're in the, the military where you're following people mm -hmm. <clears throat> by default you're you, there's a there's an aspect of trust yes and, uh, that is the cup like you're trusting in that in them that their, their goal and the direction is going to benefit you in, in the long uh, is going to benefit you in some way regardless of whether or not you understand it yes yes how does that aspect tie into a bdsm relationship with a submissive ah very good question so as a dominant or as a top as a master right a lot of the things that you're doing with your partner are helping them become a better person in some way right you're helping them learn how to serve you better right? You're teaching them things like obedience. You're teaching them things like mindfulness, right? Mm. So that they can then give you their service, give you those parts of themselves much more easily in a way that suits you and that helps you in whatever mission you're doing, right? Does that, so does that that's learning. To outside of, say, say, like in the training aspect of it, when mm -hmm. you're, say, you know, flogging someone, tying someone up, whatever mm -hmm. it is, and you're, you're reinforcing these, uh, um, you're helping them develop these character traits, right? Of obedience, sure. discipline. Mm -hmm. Does that then translate to outside that context, the sexual context, in the in the context of the rest of the relationship? It depends entirely upon the dominant and how he's going about things and the things that he's trying to instill, right? Mm -hmm. So if I'm instilling in somebody obedience and uh, sort of fortitude in, me every, in order to take a long flogging scene because I enjoy flogging somebody, you're going to take it because that's what I want to do, right? there's a lot of lessons that the submissive is learning at that point in time in, turn, in terms of giving themselves up in service to somebody else, making their body, making themselves an object of pleasure for somebody else, right? It's also teaching them to be able to endure uncomfortable shit for long periods of time because it needs to be done, right? <laughs> 
if you're teaching a submissive, like I want my coffee done exactly this way and exactly this purpose, and you will present it to me exactly this way, you know, nearly exactly the position with your eyes cast exactly here and so forth and so on, you're teaching them attention to detail. Yep. Right. You're teaching them that no matter what you as an individual think of how this is being done, it's not being done for you. You're doing this for somebody else. And the attention to detail makes a difference to them. Right. Now, a good dominant is actually going to teach the submissive why he's doing all these different things, right? Right, right. It's going to give them ways to take those lessons outside to the rest of their life, right? Right. So, so yeah, the, the learning lesson and then <clears throat> giving them the, the context as to why so that they can, they can apply it in the rest of their life. And that's, this is kind of what I was asking. Yeah. Is, yeah, yeah. How does it translate? And the, and that's and that's the thing is you it it's up to the dominant to show their submissive how they can contextualize that in other situations, right? One thing that a good dominant will do is teach a submissive that they should be giving their service to people who deserve it. Hmm. Right? They should be giving themselves to people who actually deserve it, right? And how to recognize those kinds of people, which also means not giving it to people who don't deserve it. Right. Which means not allowing themselves to be taken advantage of in various situations throughout the world. Don't just go along to get along. Stand on your own two fucking feet. That person doesn't deserve it. They don't deserve that deference. They haven't earned it. Right. Mm -hmm. Learning how to recognize people that they can put their trust in and who they shouldn't be putting their trust in. Right. And that kind of discernment on who to follow, who not to, how to handle people who don't. Right. That's incredibly valuable lessons that they can then take throughout their life. Hmm. So you just gave a really good example of, um, of something you would say, I mean, I'm assuming the example you gave is something you have done in your past, in your uh, past, uh, yeah. <clears throat> Dobbs and relationships with the coffee situation, right? Um, I'm not that particular. That's actually oh, one really? of the things that I'm most difficult about is that like, I want coffee in the morning. Just bring me coffee with some cream and a, a bit of sugar in it, and I'm fucking happy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I do. I am particular about like, okay, you have to use this kind of coffee. It's got to be this kind of strength, right? right? But I've got my coffee grinder already set up. You push the button, it gives you exactly the right amount of coffee. You got to measure shit, <laughs> right? I'm not that particular. One of the uh, it was a couple couple seminars ago, a couple webinars ago, John was uh, sitting there and Miss MLD was there and he was having her make this uh, Caesar salad, right? And he's like, I want it like this and I want exactly this much dressing and I want the chicken diced up like this and give me some tomatoes, some avocados and this and this. And she's like, oh, well, we don't have this. It's like, well, go out and get some and bring it back and then do it like this. Do it like this. <laughs> he was incredibly particular about what he wanted. Mm. I don't care that much. Um, yeah. The stuff, I'm not as big into the ritual side of things of sit here, do this, do, I'm not that particular. I'm much more of a, I want baseline levels of respect. I want baseline levels of deference, right? Um, when we're out, she's on my left side with me, right? I open the doors for her because I think that's what I should be doing as a gentleman. And when she steps through, she waits for me yep, because she's not a bitch, right? Yep. She's there to wait for me, right? Lots of little things like that. Mm. I think the biggest thing we do in terms of rituals with my, with my current girl is that whenever she comes over or whenever I go over to see her, like, one of the first things we do after we, you know, say hello and kind of like get to a normal state, right? Because you have to kind of transition from normal people mode to kink mode, right? We don't get to be fully dominant, fully submissive 24 seven. We're not in that kind of relationship. We don't have that kind of, we're not sitting at the kink.com armory, unfortunately, <laughs> really kind of cool. But um, once we sort of like get that baseline level rapport again, you know, she kneels down, I put the collar on her, she changes into whatever outfit she's, outfit she's gonna be wearing or nothing at all, depending upon the day, right? And then she gets her spanking. Every time, first thing that we do is she gets her spanking. Now, a lot of times it's just a fun spanking. Sometimes it's a you done fucked up spanking. And there's yeah, a difference. Yeah. That was going to be my next question. Was <clears throat> say you're say say you're with a, a new girl in this situation, right? Yes. Uh, who hasn't learnt all how you like to have things done, or hasn't learnt yeah. all the things you like. So, for example, what you just gave. So she walks mm -hmm. through. She walks through the door before you. Mm -hmm. uh, during the daytime or something, right? Mm -hmm. How does that uh, misstep by her translate into correction in the BDSM sense once the collar's on? Ah, okay. So a lot of it doesn't happen while the collar's on, hmm. right? In terms of... From...
me and I think you are dropping out really quickly or am I dropping out Mm. Let's see if it's working. It goes in the chat. Is it me or is it Ryan? It looks like it's Ryan who's like those little things of like Helen walking. If you, I think you are. Oh, according to Osama bin Chicken, it was uh, you who was lagging. Ah, uh, well, son of a bitch. Okay, so getting back into it, I was uh, talking about like rituals and stuff and how we train things like that, right? Yeah. Um, really, it just kind of comes down to as the situations occur saying, okay, this is what I want you to do. It's like, I want you to do a instead of B, right? I want you to do this instead of that. Are you doing um, that? Are you correcting her in the moment as well? So yes. Yes, the the definitely. Cool. Yep. Definitely. Cause she's not going to understand what I don't, what I don't want her to do if I don't tell her yeah. now, other dominants do it a different way. I got a friend of mine who loves just his, 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 his thing. He loves to fuck with people. He just loves fucking with people. So with his girl, for example, he'd say, okay, go make me a cup of coffee. And then she'd bring him back. She'd go make coffee. She'd bring a cup. And so he tells so like, nope, that's not right. And just hand it to her. It's like, go try again. And wouldn't bother to tell her <laughs> what was wrong. <laughs> and just make her. I think she went through like 10 or 11 pots of coffee before she got it right. And that's oh part God. of it is because he likes it like ridiculously fucking strong. Huh. Right. And like five or six in, she, he's like, no, this is too weak. Try again. Right. He finally so gave her some, some feedback. Something. <laughs> but after five or six times, right? But that's because he loves fucking with people that way. Right. Right. <laughs> there's also an I'm element that of that, which is, there's an element of that, which is like the emotional roller coaster, which women yes. love. The unpre- yes. he's like, he's this emotional slot machine. Cause if yes. she, he's fucking with her constantly like that and she doesn't know when she's going to be doing things correctly or incorrectly. That's like, that's all the drama she needs. Like, yes, coming from him, and he's in, he's in control of the, the, what's the expression? Like he's the one that's in control of the roller coaster. Yes, exactly, that, yeah. exactly. It's really that's fun. what that's yeah. That's one of the things that are um, really really good about BDSM. That's um, that I, that I love is that you get to give every bit of every range of emotion to your partner mm. anytime you please. Mm. You can be incredibly soft and caring. You can be incredibly violent and cruel. You can be incredibly sensual. You can be incredibly distant and you can do all of things, all of those things intentionally within different BDSM scenes and different BDSM contexts mm. in a completely normal, loving way. I can be as cruel as I please in a completely loving way. I can beat her ass until she's screaming, crying, it's not running down her face or ass is bruised for three days out of love. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? think- and the other thing, the other thing is that um, one of the things that, that Siren kept on talking about is the fact that she's a brat and she likes to kind of test people and push buttons like that, right? Mm-hmm. It actually gives you a way to for for the your partners to let you know when they need more, right? Because if they start acting up a bit, that's them saying, hey, I haven't gotten enough dominance lately. You haven't yeah. given me enough of X. Yes. So yes. please, dear God, beat my ass for being a brat. <laughs> Well, it's it's the same as as, as uh, when a woman shit tests you in a relationship. It's yeah, her, and that's the th- her saying. Hey, I haven't seen enough evidence of you of you being the man lately. Yes, so fuck it, I'm yes. gonna poke, I'm gonna poke the bear until the bear fucking puts me in my place. And it's not that she's trying to test you to see if you're there. If you are, she's giving you an opportunity to show it again because she wants to feel it. Mm, right it's mm, a very mm. different thing if you start looking at shit tests and as an invitation for her to feel how dominant you are and feel how masculine you are and get that like hit a heroin again mm. that she's craving then shit tests become a very different thing right it's a bit, totally different frame in your mind it's, it's gone from yes. being like oh this is like a, literally a test that i have to pass Mm-hmm. Or an annoyance to being like, okay, it's, an, it's a fun opportunity for me to like. Exactly. Or a sign of disrespect, right? Mm-hmm. Or a sign of disrespect, right? Yeah. And the other thing is that it very quickly becomes clear when if you take it that way and you respond as if it's that kind of thing and she responds badly, then you know it is disrespect or a shit test or something else. 
right? Mm. But by assuming, you know, good faith in a way in the beginning of just, she needs another hit of this goodness that I've got mm. and take it from that perspective to first, then nine times out of 10, that's actually the case. And it reinforces your roles, right? It reinforces your different uh, places in the relationship, makes it stronger. Whether that's a fuck buddy relationship with the yes relationship or long-term relationship, whatever it happens to be, right? Mm. It reinforces that. And it also shows that you're socially calibrated. And it also shows that you give a shit, even if you're beating your ass, right? <laughs> what's that? What's the, like? What's the old expression? Like the opposite. The opposite of hate. Or the opposite of love is not hate. It's indifference. Yes, hundred percent. Right? So it's very totally time to be like to be hating on someone beating a girl's ass in the context. Yeah. Don't take me out of context here, please, anyone. Because <laughs> uh, yes. uh, you're not indifferent. No. But, but like you did, but you did say before, you can take that away. You can give it that coldness, that distance, as well. Yes. Because that's again, that's emotional. That emotional fucking roller coaster. This the reason I am. I really wanted to get you on so ASAP, especially in relation to the whole siren uh, demerit for you a couple of days ago. Is because I think that like everything that you are talking about right now, everything. Mm-hmm. The more and, and I, let, I'm going to give it a context here. I've worked professionally for Kink.com as a dominant in scenes. Mm-hmm. I am not, however, a lifestyle BDSM dom. Right, I've never, I've never been in the lifestyle. I've been in the swinging scene. Right. But I haven't been in the BDSM lifestyle scene, and sure. been in a tradition, a, a you know, a BDSM dom sub relationship like you have. Yep. So for me, this is extremely. I'm very, very. Cu- I'm at a point right now where I'm very curious about it uh, because I know a few guys like you who. I know one guy in particular, and I mentioned him on Donovan Sharp show. Uh, on was that yesterday? It was yesterday. God, it was a long day yesterday. Uh, and what was his name? Uh, I didn't mention his name because he okay. he does not have a. Uh, he's back in Australia. But I know I know this guy. He's been. He's also ex-military, ex-Australian military. He has been a dom for quite a long time. He's like forty years old, kind of chubby to be perfectly honest. Uh, not the greatest shape. He's gone through about nine Instagram accounts now because the feminists keep getting triggered every time he posts photos. <laughs> of his family. His family yeah. is him. Him and his se- uh, his five, well, he's got seven submissives. He's got five mm-hmm. of them who are wives, two of them who are girlfriends. And I asked him nice. about, I asked him about how he sort of sets things up because I've seen photos of him uh, when I've seen photos of him getting his submissives to sign contracts. Yes. And I asked him about it yesterday, and he gave the the reply he gave me. I was like, "How does this thing work? Is this a legally binding contract?" Blah blah. blah. The reply he gave me was about. No joke, like I've, on a Facebook message, it would have gone over like two A4 sheets of paper. Is that the explanation? Okay. Is that in depth? Uh, so I'm going to be getting him on the show at some point, but he doesn't have any social media awesome. anymore. He got he got everything like banned. Uh, mm. or like, uh, well, he got Instagram's banned, and then he decided to get off Twitter because he was sick of. He actually, I think, through me, he kind of discovered the manosphere kind of stuff mm-hmm. and a little bit of the red pill stuff, and he was getting a bit like he was butting heads with it a fair bit. Um, yeah, because he's more of the open relationship side of things. Sure, sure. Well, That's actually something we should get into as well later yes, on. But yeah, yeah I do. I, I do intend to do that. Um, but I, I, looking at the way he structures his relationships, there is, and because there's so many guys in in the red pill manosphere space, what do you want to call it, who are mm-hmm. frustrated with with women right now because they're frustrated yeah. with with Western women, right? Yep. In particular, because they're not. They're not pre-made like they yep. like they imagine they were 50, 60, 70 years ago. You understand oh, yes. what I'm saying when I say that. Pre-made. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like like sub- feminine, submissive, uh, demure, you know, like yep. uh, willing to 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 please and serve, willing to bear children. Yep. Be, be yep. The, the mother of the family, take take the, the caretaker role in the family, uh caretaker role. Um like look after the kids, yep. house, etc. All this stuff, right? That's I would. Ref- that's like the pre-made woman kind of archetype from like the 1920s or whatever, right? Sure, traditional female roles. Yes, right, right. So a lot of guys are frustrated that they can't find a woman that would fit that role, mm-hmm. or they find because because all the women are have overinflated sense of ego. They've got a uh, overinflated uh, sense of value thanks to things like Instagram and OnlyFans and all this kind of crap, right? Yep. So I see. 
what he's doing in his BDSM relationship and the way his women adore him and serve oh, yeah. him qu- without question, do any e- anything and everything at the drop of the hat. And I'm like, this guy has exactly, ha- has seven times exactly what every one of these dudes is looking for. So there's, yep. I think, uh, and I think you and me, Together, Ryan, we're going to start. Intro- we need to start introducing a lot of these BDSM co- like dom sub relationship concepts to this space because it's yeah. so translatable. It doesn't oh, have 100%. It doesn't even have to be an official BDSM relationship. All the principles that Ryan is talking about here should be applied in a long term relationship if you're looking to, to find a suitable long term. I'm going to go on a little bit of a run here because there's a several different things that we need to talk about about this whole situation. Number one, I want to clarify that I'm not really a lifestyle dominant. I don't have a 24-7 submissive. I've never really had that kind of relationship. Hmm. To me, submission is an undercurrent that kind of undergirds the relationships that I am that we play with explicitly from time to time. All right. She's always my girl. She's always daddy's baby girl. But we're not 24-7, 365, that thing. There are men out there who want that kind of dynamic, who want that level of control, who want that level of discipline, who are willing to be that explicit and discerning and discriminating about, I wanted this and this and this and this, and write out the contracts and all that shit. I'm not that guy. Right. All right. That said, one thing, one thing that you have to understand about that guy in Australia is that the reason he has seven of those girls, two different things you need to talk about, about that one. Number one, The only reason he's got seven is because he knows his fucking shit. He lives that fucking life. He is 100% on point, and he has to be that freaking sharp and that high value of a man to be able to pull that off. The second thing you need to notice is that there are... It's absolutely a full-time job. Oh, 100%. He's he's retired, which is why he's able to do it. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. The second thing you need to understand is that it's in Australia, which is one of the most feminist countries in the world, even worse than the U.S. in a lot of ways. And there are not one, not two, seven fucking women willing to share the same goddamn guy to get that dominance, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to get that structure and control, to be with a man who is unabashedly fucking masculine, living his life, saying, this is who I am. This is how I'm living. This is the deal. These are the rules that you will follow if you're going to live with me. This is who you will be if you're going to be in my life. And oh, by the way, sign on the freaking guided line what this contract is. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Seven, not one, yeah. not two, seven for an old fucking retired guy who's out of shape and not that good looking. Yeah. I mean, he's probably, he's got, he's got a, he's got a gigantic penis. I will say that much. Uh, he, he sure. Does, but that's not something cool. you're going to be showing on Tinder usually, but yes. you know, and it's not um, something you're let like, swinging out in, in, in public, unless you're on Folsom street during certain fairs. But yeah, point being like, it has to be, these are inherent qualities that this man has developed that are so freaking desired and so needed and so rare that women are willing to share him seven times over to be mm-hmm. one of seven, mm-hmm. not even top girl, but one of seven. And the fact that he's got like every, every one he adds just adds to the, to the value that he presents yeah. adds to the social proof. So it's like, it's, it's probably, mm-hmm. it's probably gotten even easier for like oh, after, yeah. after number two, it probably was just like downhill. It was like, Oh, this is probably. crazy. Cake. He's three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah. Well, you got to understand, like he walks into a place with a girl by his side and his girl is acting perfectly for him mm. and showing all the signs of adoration, all the signs of respect, showing this guy exactly how amazing he is. And all the women see that and go, holy crap. What's this guy got going on that this yeah. woman is that head over heels for? Oh, yeah. Is and this going guy to lives, do that for? This guy lives in rural New South Wales. So in the middle of, he's not even a, he's not in a big city. He's deliberately, deliberately in a like rural area. The the family goes out to the pub. It's him and his five five wives. Sometimes the two siblings, other girlfriends as well. And they just right. take the table. To, and it's like that. You've he's it's he's bringing with him this world. Oh, yeah. And everyone's like, who the hell is this guy? And he's right. just like sitting there having, a, having, a, having a laugh, having a good time. Like his Christmas photos with the family is like him dressed as Santa and then his seven uh, uh, Mrs. Clauses all just ad- <laughs> looking up adoring him, which is why oh, yeah. his, his damn Instagram account kept, keeps getting deleted. Because <laughs> <Yep. laughs> everyone hates him so much. <laughs> oh, yeah. 
Oh yeah. But it just speaks to like how much that kind of thing is wanted. You know, Osama Ben Chicken said something about the contract being rock solid. The contract doesn't matter. Yeah, it it's really not, fucking doesn't. It's, not, nothing, a, it's, it's not a legally binding thing anyway. Um, well, it's not, it's not even that at all. It's just the fact that he lives so congruently with mm, that mm, mm. identity with that. That is just who he is. Right. Mm. And you just can't, that's, that's not something that you can do without being that kind of guy. Cause women will see through it. They will. Oh, absolutely. Um, you yeah. wanted to, to dive into sort of the, 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 I want to, yeah, let's talk about pivot into like the swinging sure. and sort of open relationship side of things. Ooh, that's a fun place. Yeah. So, um, when I moved to DC, I was single. I got into the BDSM scene pretty much right as I got here. Um, and the first lady I dated was actually a couple of years older than me, older than me and married. And her husband was also in the scene. So the first real relationship I had in DC was a, was a polyamorous relationship where I was the extra guy on the side. Um, actually worked out really well. Like I got along with his family phenomenally. They'd invite me over to like freaking Thanksgiving dinner and stuff. And then when the kids went to bed, we'd double team her downstairs. But um, what I've noticed is that kind of backing up, there's no good relationship structure, period. None of them work. Mm. Monogamy doesn't work. Open relationships don't work. Polyamory doesn't work. Swinging doesn't work. None of it works. The only thing you can really do is figure out what it is you need what structure supports that and what trade-offs can you live with? Mm. Right. So the problem with monogamy is that we have this innate drive for needing extra partners, right? We're always on the lookout, both men and women, guys need sexual variety, women have hypergamy, yada, yada, yada. Right. So there's always that threat of external temptation, especially in the world today. Mm. Right. Now it used to be that society was structured in such a way to mitigate a lot of those external pressures. It isn't anymore. Okay. Yes. So monogamy is hard to make work in the best of times. These are not the best of times. So you start looking at, okay, let's look at non-monogamy, different non-monogamous structures, right? Well, if you look at swinging, that's one way to solve it. Okay. Because you at least get the external, the ability to hook up with other people in a structured way, right? You're swapping. So there's a quality, right? So there's nobody's being left out in theory, right? In theory, Everybody's having a good time. In theory, emotions don't get involved. So in theory, there's no threat to the relationship. There's a lot of, there's a lot of theory in the swinging. Thing, there's so. a lot of theory, right? <laughs> <laughs> there's a hell of a lot of theory. Right. And <laughs> to be honest, in order to be able to do that well, you have to be a bit of an ex exhibitionist. You have to have an incredibly high sex drive. You have to have a certain amount of detachment, right? Mm. And then you have to figure out, solve the problem of, okay, if everybody's fucking everybody, then what's special about what we have? Well, the yeah. swing scene, you solve that by saying, well, it's just sex and we don't let any emotions happen, which means that, of course, all the drama happens because people fucking catch feelings all yeah. the goddamn time. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yep. But it's one way to manage it. And there's ways to manage jealousy, the ways to manage, you know, ways to manage catching feelings and all sorts of stuff. There's ways to manage those things. But those are the problems you have to solve there. You say, OK, fine. So swinging is not it because feelings are a thing. All right. Well, then I'll just be polyamorous right? Where I can date multiple people. And so could she. Well, that gets even more complicated because now it's not just sex, but it's also emotions, which means what becomes special in your relationship gets even harder to define. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And oh, by the way, if women are free game, it tends to be the women that have more partners than men, unless you're one of those high yeah. value, high achieving guys at the top of the tier, in which case that, you've got that, 30 girlfriends. That also applies in the swinging context. Oh, yes. Well, if oh, you're, yes. you're not just partner swapping, if you're also yep. looking for like just a third, a third, yeah, 90% of the time, it's going to be, it's going to be, you're going to try and you, it's going to be a dude presenting himself rather than a unicorn, like a woman. Yes. Uh, a yes. single woman in the swinging scene. Yep. Yep. So, Polyamory gets really complicated because it can be incredibly difficult to know that your relationship is actually secure in any real way. Right. And there's a lot of shame and a lot of like controls and a lot of uh, myths and stuff around, Oh, well you have to be, have to have compersion, which is this idea that you have to get joy from your partner being happy. Right. So you right. be, you like, you like the fact that she's going off and getting fucked because she's enjoying herself and she's getting something she needs. Right. And she's supposed to enjoy the fact that you're going off and fucking somebody else because you're getting something you need. Right. Doesn't work for 99.9% .9 of people. 
No, it does, so it, that, 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 cause that's, that's part of the element of swinging as well, is that yes. you're supposed to get off on the idea of your partner getting off, even if it's not yes. with you. And it's, yes. and it really doesn't work. Like, I mean, it doesn't work for everybody. And it's, mm-hmm. You're 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 really nailing it on the head here. This is a fantastic, fantastic breakdown. I'm like everybody in the chat right now, one's in the one's in the goddamn chat because this is fire. What Ryan is telling us all right now is absolutely brilliant. And make sure you're smashing that like button as well because tons of people need to see this breakdown. Everybody in the absolutely community, absolutely, um, absolutely, do. You're fighting against your as a guy, especially. You're fighting against your biological urges. I mean, your bio, the biological instincts of jealousy. Every mm-hmm. time your your partner is sleeping with another dude, you know yep. it, it's just in it's, it's in here. We can't. It's ingrained in us. We can't help oh, it. Yeah. We can try to to pervert it. We can try to we can uh, um, convince ourselves that it is a turn on or what you know. We can mind fuck ourselves into changing it and changing the way we interpret it, but mm-hmm. the initial reaction is still there. Oh yeah, you know oh, yeah. So there's actually, so there's a couple things that I kind of want to talk about, about this piece. Um, and the reason why I know all these different problems is because I've fucking lived them all. Oh yeah. I've done that. Yeah. I've lived them as well. So I'm, I'm like everything, oh, yeah, everything yeah. I'm relating to. <laughs> right. So with my last marriage, you know, we met in the BDSM scene. We were together for about six and a half, almost seven years. Um, she was by, I think she would have been much happier if we had been basically monogamous. We never did the swinging thing to get, well, I guess we did do the swinging thing a little bit together. Um, we did a couple orgies. Like we've, and I invited all kinds of girls into the relationship. Together. We did a couple of orgies. Yeah, That's I guess it's like, yeah. Bit of an anyway. <laughs> but for the most part, like in the later part of the relationship, it was very much uh, more of a polyamorous thing. Right. Mm-hmm. And part of this does come from me recognizing that I'm built a certain way and she needed different things. Okay. She's very much into rope. I'm not really a rope guy. That's just not, that's not the tool that I, in the toolbox that I reach for when I go to BDSM. And I can talk about my toolbox theory of BDSM in a minute, but, and I'm also not really that like strict, hard Dom type. I'm not that really structured type. And those were things that she really wanted and she really needed. So I'm like, okay, I get why you would go to somebody else to get those things. Right. So on that perspective, I get it. Right. And she was also not really into heavy impact. I'm really big into heavy impact and the floggers and like punching and beating the shit out of people. I love being able to cut loose that way. She couldn't take it. Right. So me going in sourcing that with other people that filled that cup for me, right. Her getting that thing from somebody else made perfect sense, but I'm kind of biblical in my relationships in that I'm a jealous God and thou shalt have no other gods before me. <laughs> right. In have that. You, have you read um, alpha God? Have you read that book? I have not yet. It's on my list. I've got about 30 fucking books behind me that I got to work my way through. There's a whole, like, that statement you just made is the entire book is based around, like, where where does this statement kind of come from? Like, and it's like, Mm -hmm. like, every archetype of God is literally like the most alpha kind of dude you can imagine. He's like incredibly jealous, incredibly violent, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But anyway, sorry. I'm distracting you. No, no. I'll add that to my list yet again. I've heard about 17 people tell me I need to read it. So it's on my list. I just haven't picked it up and got to it yet. But the point being that as long as I am first in that relationship, as long mm-hmm. as I am first in her mind, yeah. then I'm okay. I don't necessarily like it, but I'm willing to accept that she will get other things from other places that either I can't provide or to just get a little bit of variety. Yep. It's kind of like cost of doing business in a way, right? Mm-hmm. The problem is whenever she gives to someone else something she's denying for me, right? Or she breaks the rules for someone else, right? Because if you go back to Rolo talking about how women make rules for betas and they break break rules for alphas, Mm -hmm. if she's breaking the rules that we've made, that means that I'm not top dog. Exactly. Exactly. If she's willing, if she's willing to give something else to something to somebody else that she's unwilling to give to me, Mm -hmm. That means I'm not top dog. Yep. That's when lines get crossed, and that's when I really get fucking. And if you're not, that's if, when if, do not work. And if you're not top dog, then why is she getting? Then why is she being treated like she's top? Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. Top you know, girl. Yeah. Top girl. Right. Whatever. Uh, Primark. Thank you for the shout out. Good to see you in the chat. It's a, new, uh, a new name I haven't seen before. Uh, everybody in the chat. Thank you. So, I'm. I'm so 
glued to, to what Ryan is saying. <laughs> I'm not really paying too much attention to what's going on in the chat right now. But trust me, uh, uh, if, you, if you do have any questions for Ryan, save them sort of towards the end because we will mm-hmm. uh, we'll throw as much as we can at this young man while he's, uh, while he's here with us. I love the fact that you call me young. I am not fucking young, but we're going to get it. It's fine. <laughs> I'll tell you what. I do not fucking feel 45. I have been like these days. Uh, I am feeling better than I ever really have. I'm crushing it more than I ever really have because I've gotten into the space and doing a lot of the self-improvement work. And even though I'm 45, even though I've had two fucking surgeries this year and I'm still recovering from my last one, like I am on top of the goddamn world, dude. It's amazing how young you feel when you're on your purpose Oh. You're doing the things in life that make things that that really fill your cup, man. When you're just like, whether a lot of guys just fucking killing life, God, <sighs> should have been and doing this all along. But oh well. and when you're surrounding yourself with other guys who are doing the same thing, very true. It it's very just, very true. It keeps pushing you. It keeps pushing you. You know, that's uh, uh yep. that's why I'm you know I'm really glad to have connected with people like you this year. Yeah, this year, yeah. like everyone, everyone else is like. I mean, you, you, you and me have a very similar, have had a very similar year by the sound of it. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, else in a lot like, of ways. Everyone else is like, oh, 2020 is terrible. It's the worst year ever. We're, meanwhile, us two have completely changed our life. We're on like cloud nine. We're on a rocket ship to the moon. It's yep. like fucking love. I love 2020, man. I'm going to look back on this year as the year that a lot of shit turned around for me. Uh, God, who was it? I think it was um, Mike Medici on Twitter made this post, you know, and he's a guy that you should definitely be following. If you're not, I'll, I'll hop him. I'll tag you to him later on in a DM or whatever. But he had this post about like, you know, if you come out of this coronavirus thing and you haven't started your business and lost all this weight and done all these things, like then you never were going to do them because yeah. you have nothing but time right now. Exactly. Yeah. You've got nothing but time or excuse. Nothing but time. A lot of people have nothing but excuses. though. That's the problem. Yes. Um, true, true, true. Yeah. But that's why you got guys like me to help them get over shit like that. But we can talk about that later. Exactly. We will talk about that. We will talk. I promise everybody awesome. we will talk about hypnosis at some point. Um. <laughs> but to circle back to the whole relationship thing, right? So if I am a jealous God, thou shalt have no other gods before me, then it actually becomes very easy to figure out where you're at in that relationship. If she's breaking your rules, you're not top dog. If she's doing things for other people that she won't do for you, you're not top dog. Mm-hmm. And you need to do something about it or she needs to get moving on, right? And that unfortunately is kind of what happened with my second wife is, you know, at a certain point I realized that she was not actually on board with the plan. And the things that she said and what she did were not in alignment. Mm. And I've been paying attention to what she was saying. And trying to give her time and space to make that happen and trying to help her do that. And she was just not doing the work. And it got to a head at one point. I'm like, okay, this is it. Either shape the fuck up or ship out. And she told me she could not be the woman that I needed her to be. And so that was that. Mm -hmm. Now, since that time, I mean, I have had two long-term relationships since then. Um, I got divorced, what, three years ago now? And I've been in a long-term relationship for two and a half of those years, right? So it didn't take me very long to find new girls. And that actually kind of circles back to the whole Australia, Western women thing, because both of the girls that I've been in long-term relationships were both Indian. Hmm. Both grew up in traditional Eastern Indian households, right? right? So they grew up in an environment where it was a very traditional feminine role was what was expected of them. All right. Now they were both feminist. You know, one of them actually works for the Democratic Party here in D.C., right? Um, drives a Prius, is a, ve- is a vegetarian the whole nine yards. Didn't choose the best with that one. But uh, the point was that once she found me, she was much more willing to be submissive to me because she'd already kind of had that training, right, in a lot of ways. Mm. The second girl, the same way, she had also been, she also identifies as a feminist. She still does. And I'd still give her shit for that constantly. Right. But at this, at the same time, she grew up in a very traditional Indian household. So she loves being able to cook, to clean, to do things for me, to take care of me, to clean the house for me. Right. Whenever I had surgery, she picked me up from the hospital, took care of me for a couple of days while I was here. And she thanked me for the opportunity to do that for me because it let her show her appreciation for the things that I've done in her life. Cause she's recognized the impact that I've had in her life and making her better. Right. 
most traditional Western women that have been live in feminized countries can't do that. They haven't learned the skills. It yeah. sucks, but they just haven't. There's a there's like they haven't learned how to be humble. No, they don't. When they when they need to be humble, you know, like men are, men are told all oh, yeah. all all the freaking time, like you should be hungo, humble, you shouldn't be, uh, you shouldn't have an ego, you shouldn't be cocky. I mean, you you were was it was it with Siren that I was mentioning that? Yeah, yeah, it was with the interview I was doing with Siren. Where we talked mm-hmm. about like she was saying don't uh, to dudes don't be cocky, but women and men have a very different understanding of the word cocky. Like, and oh, yes. it, it was blatantly obvious by the way she was using she was describing it. Um, oh yes, oh yes. But, but and well, to be honest with told, you, women are never told, or at least Western women are not told, never told, don't be cocky, don't be narcissistic, be be humble. When mm-hmm. it's because uh, there's there's times when you should bloody well be humble. Yeah, well, it's very much a situation where you know, like Rollo says, you know, men are being raised as defective women, and women are being raised to be men. Yeah. So you understand why they don't want to submit because most of their options aren't very good these days. <laughs> You look around at the average state of the guy these days and it is not fucking pretty. Absolutely. Right. A lot of the girls that I'm matching with on like Tinder and Hinge and Bumble and all those other things are in their early twenties because they're like, I refuse to date men my age. They're all trash. They all suck. (laughs) It's just true, man. It's (laughs) It's just true. So, you know, fundamentally, once they find a guy like that, their whole world changes. You know, the girl that I'm seeing now, like I said, she was, whenever we met, she was like, oh, I don't have time for a relationship. I'm going to be getting my master's. I'm focused on my career. Just don't have time for that stuff. Yeah. Three months in, she's like, uh, so I may or may not have been browsing wedding rings. And what do you think about white picket fences and children? <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> right? Because she found a guy that had his shit together, that was willing to lead, that was dominant, that set boundaries, that could enforce them, that had her best interest at heart, that could show her the ways of the world all those things that she never thought were fucking possible. Mm. And as soon as she found that everything changed in an instant because she realized the value that I was bringing to the table. And she realized that in order to have that, she had to step the fuck up. And Oh, by the way, that pushed the baby button and all those traditional things that are laying dormant. in most of those girls, because they can't find a man to push that button. And as mm. soon as they do a, sw- a switch gets flipped in their head and they just go crazy in a way. Because they're getting something that they can't get any other way. Yeah. Um, I want to circle back really quickly because there was a question mm-hmm. I wanted to ask you when we were talking about uh, BDSM relationships that I didn't, I didn't sure. uh, ask you. And that was so. I've always had this sort of uh, uh, thought in my head that mm-hmm. if you're, and maybe you can uh, uh, tell me if this is sort of the way guys in the in the lifestyle try to tend to do this. I mentioned before how if she fucks up during the day, does something you don't want her to do, right? And the example mm-hmm. we used was she walks through the door before you do. Yeah. Um, obviously, you're, you're correcting her there in a the moment. Mm-hmm. When it comes time, when it, when in that that evening, when you two are engaging in your dom-sub dynamic, yep. do you bring that up and punish her for it? Depends. Like, if it's a serious fuck up, yes. Or if she's doing it deliberately, because sometimes... One that, thing that, that my, girl, my next question was going to be, if yeah. you are you positively reinforcing bad behavior because then she's oh, going to get something uh, that get something she wants by fucking up. Here's the difference. Okay. There's a difference between a good girl spanking and a bad girl spanking. Okay. A good girl spanking is like the ones you do on set, right? You're beating her ass. She's enjoying it. Like she gets the pain. She gets the intensity. A bad girl spanking is I'm beating her ass until I'm done. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not until she's done. Very <laughs> subtle difference, right? You could be crying and screaming as much as you want. If I'm not done yet, we're not done. Does that? Uh, how does that play in term in terms of say safe words and things like that? Does the, does the oh, safe sure. words those are always in play? play. Yeah, no, the, the safe words are always in play, right? Okay. But okay. the other thing that you have to to kind of understand is, God, how to put this? Um, brats, a lot of times, one of the reasons why I don't like brats why I freaking despise brats as a general rule mm-hmm. is that if they start acting up in some ways, they are trying to get you to punish them. Yeah. If you don't enforce that boundary, they lose respect for you or they continue to act up. Exactly. Right? So it's, you're in this fucked up 
a double a, a double bind. Yeah, catch twenty two, catch twenty two. Right, you don't yeah. actually have you kind of don't have the ability to consent as a dominant or a top, right? Because you either give them what they want, yeah, which is not the way that's supposed to work, or you lose frame, you lose the dynamic, and oh by the way, yeah, you lose face, and it's like no, then I still don't get what I want. So neither way am I really getting what I want. Now there's dominants who enjoy that dynamic, right? Mm. I'm not really not one of those guys, right? <laughs> it can be done well. It can be done correctly if both if both sides of the equation kind of know what they're getting themselves into and agree to that dynamic, and that's cool and all. I'm not that guy. Mm. Now, one thing about my girl is that she hates the fact that I'm not monogamous, right? Because I haven't stopped looking for other partners while I'm seeing her. So whenever she's in this moment where she feels like that's happening or she doesn't get have enough confidence that I'm still just seeing only her, which I'm I'm that I'm never going to give her that confidence because I want that strategic ambiguity ambiguity because I'm not monogamous. I want to keep my options open. She will start acting up. So there's things that she's supposed to do for me every day that she'll stop doing. She'll start being a little bit more stippy and everything else. And I know that she's doing that on purpose because she's upset with the fact that I'm not falling into her frame. That is something that I will punish her for. Right, because she's breaking the agreement. She's not asking permission to skip things and stuff like that. Mm. It's not that I'm punishing her for not, you know, liking the fact that I'm not monogamous. That's stupid. I'm punishing her for not being honest about what's going on. Right. Mm. So you have to be very careful about what you're doing and why. Yeah, you got to be. You have to be clear what you're doing and why. You got to be. You, you, you got to be steps message. ahead. You got to be steps ahead yes. in the whole process. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. That's the thing. I, the best part is the best part is when you can tell her why she's doing shit because she doesn't know or she doesn't realize it. Mm. When you know her better than she knows herself, then you can really have some fun. Right. <laughs> it's like uh, I, I know. Um, I actually I asked this question to uh, Abu American mm -hmm. a while ago. And I said, I said to him, like, how do you, in his, in his specific example, obviously he's living an Islamic mar marriage mm -hmm. and, uh, um, you know, so, so his wife isn't allowed to leave the house uh, yep. without, his, without, his, uh, without him chaperoning her, right? Yep. So I actually asked him, like, how do you, because uh, we all know, like, you know, you want to you take away attention, right? If sure. you're acting up, to, at, let's, we're not talking BDSM right now. Mm -hmm. Changing gears again. So, in a yep. not in a traditional uh, re male female relationship, which doesn't have a BDSM context, the way you would punish a girl would be to just withdraw your attention. Yes. And uh, uh, my question to him was: Okay, if you're living in a household with a couple of women, how does that work? And uh, or uh, well, if you're living in a house, if you're actually living with a woman, how do you with? I asked him, how do you withdraw your attention from her if you're literally around her? Like it's kind of hard, you know. If like you're sitting there in the kitchen or whatever, you're working, and then she's like there. I'm like, how? Well, how exactly do you with, with, like kind of get away from her completely if she's being a being a cunt? Uh, and his answer, he it it sort of made me. Th this, I'm going to relate this back to what you just said when we said. Mm -hmm. You want to, uh, you got to st think a few steps ahead. It was, well, he's like, well, she can't leave the house without me. So I go and do something fun without her. And I let her know. I'm going to go fly my drones now or whatever it might be. You know, yep. normally her, like her, him taking her out of the house is fun excursion time for her. Yep. Which she enjoys. It's a reward. So he takes away the reward he normally gives her and he goes, does, does, goes into something fun without her. Now, that's not really possible with a, with a non-Islamic relationship because she can... But it, Here's what I would challenge you on. The point, I'm trying, make, the point I'm trying to make is that he has structured things in a way in advance that he can win. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, a couple of different things. Number one, he's absolutely right. You have to have, you have to be thinking a few steps ahead of like how you're going to handle different situations. Another thing I would say is I would challenge you on the idea that you can't ignore someone or you can't withdraw attention if they're in the same house. That's 100% possible. Hmm. They're having been married 
and been spending several days with a wife where we really didn't say shit to each other because we were avoiding the crap out of each other. It's easy. Mm. <laughs> it is infinitely easy. <laughs> Throw on a couple of noise canceling headphones and work on your computer for six or seven hours after you get home and then just go straight to bed. Right. Roll over and don't talk to her. It is easy as hell to withdraw attention in that context. And I'd also say that you can do that in a BDSM context as well. Mm. When my girl starts acting up, I don't text her as much. She doesn't get her phone calls at night, right? I'm busy. I got other shit going on, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you can still withdraw rewards. You can still withdraw attention. You can still withdraw some favorable treatment. You can still withdraw the treats until she starts acting right, right? Yeah. The other thing I'll say is that punishment in a lot of ways is a really good thing, especially in a BDSM context, because it gives them something that, at least this has been my, my experience, submissives have a really hard time forgiving themselves. Hmm. So by punishing them, you give them absolution. Wow. Right? Because they've taken the punishment, they've felt the pain, they've had the emotional release, they've had the catharsis, and when you're done, you're done. Hmm. They can let it go because you've taken responsibility for that, for implementing that punishment. They don't have to punish themselves anymore. Wow. I like that. <laughs> and that's one of those really cool things that a lot of people don't understand about the DS dynamic is that as the dominant, because you're taking that responsibility on yourself to deal out that punishment, they don't have to punish themselves. Just like by setting the rules for them, they don't have to take responsibility for setting the rules themselves, right? You get to free them hmm. in a lot of different ways. They don't have to worry about whether it's okay to be a slut because you're the one that set the rules around their sexuality. Yeah. Right. If you've tied them up and they can't get away and they can't stop you, then of course they can have 17 orgasms because you're vibrating the crap out of them with the Hitachi, right? They don't have any control by imposing an external constraint by imposing external restraints, whether they're physical or mental, right? You allow them to set themselves free on the inside. Cause a lot of these girls have a lot of internal constraints, right? Whether that's shame, whether it's for whatever reason. So by taking control, you set them free, which is a weird way to think about things, but it's a hundred percent true. Yeah. Darren Reno with the, this is a very timely comment. I just want to bring it up right now. This is really well done. One would have to listen to this several times to get the full value. You guys are a great tag team. Look, I'm sure there's some lady out there who would love uh, for that to happen, but we yeah, are there is. a fantastic mental tag team. So thank you very much for the comment there. Um, we could do it both. Well, you know, we could do a podcast while tag teaming somebody. There's no that would be that would be a feat. That would be quite a. a that would be never, never, never before a seen, never before seen on YouTube, <laughs> uh, and would never be seen again after. Never that. seen again. Merely fans. <laughs> Holy fans. There's <laughs> other platforms we could do it on, my friend. That is true. That is true. Um, so uh, there's one. Qu there's a, there was one question up here that I want to uh, mm -hmm. uh, get both of us actually to answer. Um, Sure. Before we pivot and start talking about hypnosis, because I do want to talk about hypnosis as well. Well, good. of course. Uh, I got all night, man. Go as long as you want. Okay, good. Well, you are three hours ahead of me, so you've got less night than I do. But you know. I don't have to wake up in the morning for a while, so we're good. Yeah, well, there you Keep go. going. Uh, Just like that. This is one of those that needs to go the distance. There's a lot we need to talk about, right? Oh God, yeah. I mean, look, this is not the last time I'm going to have you on, Ryan. This is obviously this is obviously part one 100%. of percent. Oh, good. Yeah, like like I said before, you have an insight into a, a, a parallel insight to to things that I do. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of stuff that we have in common, but we come at them from a different from totally different angles. Yes. It's really fascinating for me to uh, to yep. sort of your brain about it. Uh, where was this question? Where was this question? It was a big one up here. Here it is. Yeah, from Cameron. Cameron. Pasha Sterling, but I'll also toss this to you as well. Mm -hmm. uh, how is jealousy? How is the jealousy issue handled in the adult industry? Are people always able to separate emotions because it's a profession? And this, this, you kind of did already answer this, um, in the sense that you you touched on it when you were talking about uh, swinging relationships, mm -hmm. where you set like certain things are for you two only, mm -hmm. right? And other and so the sex is in at least in, in my context an adult right when it comes to relationships in the adult industry when, when people in the adult get together mm -hmm. okay sex is obviously uh, uh, allowed in a it can and here's the different ways that I've seen people 
set the sort of boundaries in the relationship. So it could mm-hmm. be you're only allowed to fuck other people if you're getting paid for it. Mm-hmm. So it's, it could be only paid scenes. It could be you're only allowed to fuck other people if it's being filmed. So that could include paid scenes and it could include content for their OnlyFans. That could be fine. Sure. It could be um, you're not allowed to shoot you're not allowed to give your butt to anybody else. Like uh, only, only, only daddy gets the butthole. That could be the, mm-hmm. the defining line. Uh, and that's a very common one. It could be, and, and it could go as far as, oh, the only thing that is exclusive is like the, the, the is cuddles. It's like, you know, the intimacy and, and companionship mm-hmm. side of things, right? You don't go, you don't go for drinks with other people or you don't go for drinks without me, you know, yeah. uh, this side of, of the relationship. So that, that's kind of how, People like that's not well. That didn't really necessarily answer the question of how do we handle jealousy. It's uh, it's how the relationships sort of boundaries are then structured. But mm-hmm. the jealousy side of things is look, the adult entertainment industry is not uh, representative of the of the population, right? Where yeah. skewed heavily for people who are extremely randy, right? Very high sex drives uh, and are comfortable in a, a lot of us are very comfortable in open relationship types of situations. So the jealousy is dialed down quite a lot. Um, yes. It's not, doesn't mean it's not there. doesn't mean it's not there. It absolutely is there and it does manifest. Uh, um, you know, it's particularly when these sort of boundaries get crossed. Yeah. So a lot of things I want to say in this, first of all, is that there's a great book called more than two, and it is a book on polyamory from the perspective of the polyamory community. So it's blue pill as fuck. It's going to be kind of cringy from a red pill perspective. So I'm just going to warn about you that that about you right up front. The other thing I'll say is it's about 400 pages of everything that's going to go wrong when you try to do a polyamorous relationship. <laughs> All the fucking landmines, everything that you're going to go wrong, everything that's going to be absolutely horrible about it. All right. And then it talks about how to handle it within that polyamorous model. Okay. One of the things that they point out that I think it's very true is that Jealousy is a secondary emotion. Mm. So jealousy comes when something else happens, like you're threatened, you feel fear, you feel anger, you feel pain, you feel loss. And that triggers Mm. the jealousy, right? So the correct way to handle jealousy in those contexts is to look at what triggered it and why and what fears are being brought up, right? Mm -hmm. So if only daddy gets the butthole and she gives up the butthole, well, you need to understand like why you're feeling so upset that she gave up the butthole. It's just another orifice. She's getting paid for it. Like, what's the big deal, right? <laughs> so that's one piece of the puzzle. The other thing that they point out is that boundaries very, very rarely work. Mm. Whatever boundary you happen to set is probably going to get violated at some point, right? Mm. Not to mention the fact that whatever boundary you try and set is probably try is probably an abstraction of something more important, right? So if only daddy gets the butthole is the boundary, that's an artificial way of saying that you only want her to give certain things to you. You want to be special because she does X, Y, and Z for you, right? There's certain things that you can point to to say that that is mine and I know she's mine because I'm the only person that gets X, right? So if you're going to be in a non-monogamous relationship of some kind, you have to understand what it is you need, what you find threatening and why, and address that. That mm-hmm. boundaries very rarely work. That what tends to work better are laying out those things up front and saying, I need you to show me A, B, and C to be comfortable. Right? Mm-hmm. Show me I'm on top of the world show me you put me first right show me you give me things that you don't give to anybody else show me i'm special in your life right that tends to work better because if you can if they are willing to do that for you even if they do it imperfectly it's showing that 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 they are trying to meet that need of yours it's also it's it's preemptive yeah versus reactive some degree. Yeah. But it's also like, it's a positive action on their part to affirm to you how important you are rather than the absence of a negative. Yes. Yes. Right. 
having boundaries like you know don't give up the butthole to anybody but daddy you only know that she's faithful to you or you only know that you're important as long as that boundary hasn't been violated yes right yes, yes not as good of a way to go about things in my opinion yeah that's fucking fire right there rewind the last two minutes if you're watching this on re- <laughs> right now, if you're, don't know if you're watching live. If you're watching this on replay, rewind that two minutes and listen to it again in detail. What Ryan just dropped there is absolutely fantastic, fantastic advice. Man, Ryan, you're like on fire tonight, man. You're just thank brilliant. you. I love, I love it. I'm loving you. it. Good lord. Uh, let's talk. Let's start talking about. Uh, so, Cameron, I'm glad that 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 was a. Uh, so I think that kind of that was an excellent question, question, man. Yeah, very excellent question. Um, so let's talk about your your profession now, hypnosis, sure. and and because uh, a lot of guys, and I know that you got a question relating to this in the BLM uh, groups, mm-hmm. in your presentation. Because I was driving, I, I was actually driving home from an orgy in Las Vegas when I was listening <laughs> to your presentation. Uh, <laughs> uh, so you didn't you didn't get to sit down and enjoy the uh, the, the mass hypnosis session, huh? I did not. I did not. No, I tuned <sighs> in, I tuned in for the Q and A after. Uh, but someone asked you in that uh, chat, they asked you, what is the difference between meditation and mm-hmm. hypnosis and in how they can, uh, uh helps help you. So maybe, gotcha. maybe you'd have to elaborate on that. Okay. So let me put a pause on that. There's a question just popped up in the, the chat on Bert by Bert Ferguson. Oh, when I'm talking about polyamory. I just want to mention. Yeah, I just want to mention when I'm talking about polyamory, I just mean having multiple partners, whether it's multiple men, multiple women, it can go either way. It's just being non-monogamous in both directions for both partners in the relationship. Okay, yeah. so that's both poly, polygamy poly, and polygyny. Uh, yeah, yeah. polyamory normally means that you have relationships with multiple yes. people. Yes. Not just yes. sex with multiple people. Yes. So you're going it's out like having multiple girlfriends, multiple like, boyfriends. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's date nights and there's cuddles and, you know, all the other things that go yep. into the relationship is not just sex. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I hope that answers the question. It's very much just a multiple relate romantic partners for both people in the relationship. That's the kind of polyamory model. It's very open-ended for both people. Now to get back to the question that you just asked, which is what is the difference between meditation and hypnosis and how do they help you in both ways? Meditation fundamentally is a conscious process to become aware of your thoughts, aware of the things that are happening in your mind and body so that you can then quiet them down, let them go, gain more control of and awareness over those processes. Hypnosis is a very different thing. Hypnosis is fundamentally leaving the conscious mind behind to a lot of degrees and getting back to your unconscious mind, kind of that, that, uh, that more primal piece behind you that's running a lot of stuff on automatic. They've done studies with MRIs and EKG machines that are measuring different brainwave activity and meditation and hypnosis have very different effects on different parts of their brain. Mm. Okay. Depending upon the different kind of meditation, because there's different flavors of meditation as well. Like the yoga nidra that Ed from LA does uh, from embodymasculine.com. Definitely check his stuff out if you haven't already. Um, It's very different from like, say, Zen Buddhist meditation is very Mm -hmm. different from a guided meditation is very different from a moving meditation like Tai Chi or yoga, right? All of those are going to have different effects on the brain, but fundamentally with meditation, you're still very much a, in a conscious state. You're doing this deliberately for yourself on a conscious level to become aware of what's going on. You know, the thoughts that you're having, the feelings that you're having so that you can let them go so that you can get more control so you can become calmer. All right. Hypnosis is a very different beast. With hypnosis, you're fundamentally using a, it's a, it's an altered mental state of highly focused attention, a selective focused attention, okay, to where the rest of the world kind of drops away and you're just paying attention to the one thing in that moment, being the hypnotist nine times out of 10, okay? And you basically use this bridge to wake up different parts of your brain and get them talking to each other in ways that they don't normally do. And this does things like connecting parts of your brain that work with memory and sensation and meaning and emotion. All right. Is it basically like rewiring synaptic connections? Is that the intention? So sort of, I mean, just getting that state alone is just essentially creating a great deal of neuroplasticity and you can do with that what you will. All right. Cause you don't necessarily have to use hypnosis for therapeutic effects. I can just use it for fun. I could take you on vacation to Hawaii and let you live that. 
right? I can get you in a just take you to Hawaii. We can go fucking surfing, go to a luau, have a great fucking time, and I can bring you back and you never left your chair. Right. I can put you in hypnosis and give you 14 orgasms and bring you out of it only using my the sound of my voice, right? You can just have fun with it too and play around with emotion, play around with, uh, you know, with sensation and everything else. You can do all kinds of things with it. You, um, it's often used and for long-term pain management because you can actually control all of your sensations in your body are interpreted by your brain, which means that if you can get into your brain and start telling it what to do, you can determine how those sensations get processed. So you can turn down pain, hmm. right? People get migraines, for example, and have no self-hypnosis. My the teacher uh, who taught me hypnosis does this, does this all the time for her own uh, migraines. She'll just go in and turn the dial down from like eight to two to where she can function normally, even though she's got a migraine. Hmm. Right? Uh, what's her name? Kate Middleton, uh, Prince Andrew's wife. Right? Uh, in, over in England, her last baby she had through something called hypnobirthing, which is where you use hypnosis for pain control instead of like epidurals. Wow. Up until like the early, you know, late 1800s, early 1900s, they would use hypnosis for anesthesia because with hypnosis, you can actually get somebody in such a profound state of trance that they don't feel pain. And they only mm -hmm. stopped doing that because they got reliable anesthetics that didn't kill people. <laughs> right. <laughs> Once you had a drug where you just like shove it in their veins and you get a reliable effect with a reliable dosage, you didn't need hypnosis anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. And you're actually seeing a similar kind of trend with uh, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy where you're using a drug to induce a hypnotic a state similar to hypnosis because things like ketamine are hypnotic. They activate the brain in very similar ways to hypnosis. Mm -hmm. And then you could do a traditional psychotherapy assisted by the psychedelic drug or the psychotropic drug to induce a hypnotic type state. So we can do a lot of the same things you can do in hypnosis with, with a drug instead. Wow. Now there's, um, a lot of things that you can do with hypnosis. And the reason why hypnosis I think is much more powerful than meditation in a lot of ways is because it allows you to bridge into that unconscious mind, to get back to memories, to work with, you know, essentially change or modify or play with beliefs, behaviors, and emotions, which tend to be the most problematic things that fuck us up the most in our life. Bad habits, right? Mm. Bad emotions, you know, that we're dragging around for way too long or outdated beliefs that don't serve us anymore. All of those things you can play with in hypnosis, right? So one of the sessions that I did, the session that got me in hypnosis was essentially me releasing a fuckload of emotional baggage. It felt like a goddamn exorcism. I was basically hung over for a couple of days afterwards having released that much shit. Hmm. But it's like I talked about in my similar seminar in terms of like you're walking around with a, with a backpack on that's got 50 pounds in it your entire life. And through hypnosis, you drop the backpack. Well, then now you're free to move much more quickly and much more easily in pretty much any direction you want to because you're not carrying around all that extra fucking baggage, hmm. right? The hypnotic techniques that I tend to use are much more focused on modifying behavior and beliefs. So it's going back and figuring out like, why are you doing stupid shit? Like what problem are you trying to solve by holding yourself back from talking to women, for example? Yeah. Right. And then figuring out why that's there and then changing the meaning of the events that led to that so we can change the beliefs that you have around that so you can do different things in your life you 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 would call some of those things success barriers wouldn't you what's that would you call them success those uh, sort of mental blockages success barriers is that a term you would you uh, you can like i don't necessarily use terminology that way just because your mind you there's a phrase that uh, there's a psychologist by the name of Brett Steinberger up in New York. He trades, he trains like uh, Wall Street traders, right? On like high performance trading and stuff like that, right? Uh, he's got a phrase that says, today's problems are caused by yesterday's solutions. Mm. And mm. what that means is that throughout our life, we assign meaning to events that happen to us. And because we as, you know, just humans, we assign much more importance to the things that are painful than the things that are pleasurable. Yep. We tend to move away from painful things much more strongly than we move towards things that are pleasurable. These patterns get locked in our head to avoid pain throughout our life. All right. And if it's, if it's a successful pattern of behavior that keeps us away from that pain, it sticks around for longer. Right. The problem is they often stick around much longer than they're really useful. Because one thing that our unconscious mind is really bad at doing is understanding the passage of time and that things have changed. Mm. So it doesn't automatically update those beliefs back there. All right. This is why a lot of people get red pilled after trauma 
Yes. Because in that ma'am, in that moment of heavy trauma, your mind wakes up and goes, "Oh fuck! I just wrecked myself because I was doing the same shit all over again." Now I have to go back and update those things. Right now, I'm willing to take a look at these things. Yeah, the the, the pain, a very painful event, is the only thing that's able to to really re like get in there and and create new wiring. Um, neuroplasticity was is what allows it to do that. Traumatic events induce a lot of neuroplasticity. You can also induce it with meditation. You can also induce that with hypnosis. Hypnosis tends to do that more powerfully than meditation in most cases, right? Hypnosis, I found, also works much, much faster than meditation in terms of inducing change, right? So I can do, I've worked with a lot of guys who have like psychologist backgrounds and psychological training and stuff like that. Um, essentially, if you go into a traditional talk therapist, you're going to have to spend like three to six months just building rapport before you can actually get to this really important shit that comes to you that you came in there with, right? Then you're going to have to spend a year or two or three or more actually working your way through all the shit to where you have a conscious understanding of what's going on so you can modify those things and actually get a better result. With hypnosis, I basically get to buy six months of rapport in five minutes by getting you into hypnosis. <laughs> all right. Then I get to do a year or two's worth of work in an hour. Right right? Far faster, far more effective, but it does require the person that I'm working with to be fully cooperative with that process, right? Right, right. Um, Which isn't always the case. The next thing I was going to say was, say you've done a, a, a hypnosis session with, with a client, mm -hmm. is there ever a, a case where the sort of mind rebounds back again? To the old state? Yeah. Yeah, I've had it happen with a couple of guys where we do a session, it goes great, and then the next day they're right back where they were doesn't right. happen very often, but it does happen on occasion. It's are there, very, very rare. I was going to say, are there things that you, you can do to sort of prevent that as a, as a, as a client of yours, for example? So the techniques that I am using are designed to cause rapid change in a single session, right? So they're not designed for multiple iterations. Hmm. There are different ways of using hypnosis and different methodologies that you can use that do have that where you are doing things repetitively, right? Where we do a session and then after the session's done, I give you a recording of a portion of it, which like gives you all these reinforcing uh, affirmations, right? Okay. Where we go and we figure out what the problem is. And I basically spend 15 minutes telling you how awesome you are. And then I send you on your way. And then I record that 15 minutes of awesome, add in like a induction at the beginning of it. And now you have this personalized recording that's saying how awesome you are that you get to re listen to day after day after day for three or four weeks, right? that reinforces that message enough generally that it sticks hmm. okay so in those cases essentially what you'd want to do is use a technique or a methodology that's much more geared to that constant reinforcement than the techniques that i generally use all right there's also other ways you can go about the process hmm. from start to, to finish i tend to be very invasive i want to go in i want to figure out what the problem is and i want to unfuck it directly there's other techniques that you can use that are much more indirect where I'm just like saying, you know, doing a conditioning program where I am teaching you how not to focus on the negative stuff, where I teach you how to release negative emotion without having to take a look at what it is, right? Mm. And I start teaching you how to move yourself towards the things you want in life as opposed to avoiding the things that you don't, right? One of the, one of the I'll quickly interject here. One of the things I was going to ask mm -hmm. next was, say, yeah, you put your a client into, an un, uh, into a, you know, hypnotic state. You're probing around in their uh, unconscious mind to try and find mm -hmm. say, the trigger for, for some yes. bad baby, right? Mm -hmm. When the person comes out of their hypnotic state, are they aware of the trigger that you found? Do they become then subconsciously aware of what was causing the mm -hmm. fucking up in the first place? So the fundament so it depends again on the process, right? If you are a passive participant, right, where I'm, you're just sitting back and I'm just saying shit, then you may or may not remember what goes on. I've had okay. hypnosis sessions where I was a subject where I remember going into the hypnosis. I remember waking up. I don't remember what the fuck happened in between point A and point B, right? <laughs> because I was a passive participant, right? My unconscious mind was listening. It was responding. It was doing its thing. It didn't need to tell me what the hell was happening. I figured out what was going on later on, a couple of days down the road, things started coming back. But at that point in time, I didn't need to know. So it didn't bother showing me. When I'm doing this sort of thing, it's a very interactive thing. I need you to be an active participant in that process, mm. which means you are aware of everything that's going on and you remember everything that happens nine times out of 10, unless you don't want to, right? I'm not doing anything in particular to make you forget it, right? Which means often you come out of hypnosis and go, I had no idea 
like, or I haven't thought about that in decades. Right. Wow. And if that's the case, then yes, actually being consciously aware of all that crap that was fucking you up. And also by the way, how we reframe things and how you can now move forward with a different way actually reinforces that for you. And that's all that most guys need. Right. Mm -hmm. But the thing is that hypnosis is just a state. It's just an altered mental state of highly focused selective attention. What you do in that state, you can do a lot of different things. And there's a lot of different techniques, a lot of different modalities, and a whole lot of space to play within that space. How you get there, there's a number of different ways you can get there. How you get out, there's a number of different ways you can get out. The stuff that you can do while you're there is pretty goddamn amazing. And I'm honestly just kind of scratching the surface on this stuff. There's all kinds of shit that I still want to explore. You mind uh, taking a couple of questions after you finish this last uh, sentence? No, absolutely, that. absolutely, okay. sure. Let's like for that. example, one of the most one of the most uh, interesting and unique uh, things that you can do in hypnosis is breast enhancement. So you can actually use hypnosis to turn back on all the hormonal processes that women use to grow breast tissue, and over the course of 60, 90, 120 days, give them natural breast enhancement. On average, two inches in circumference and a cup size <laughs> through hypnosis. <laughs> you got to start a come, to, come to LA, and, start a clinic doing that. Right? <laughs> All the porn industry chicks will be lining up. Give me, give me the introduction, dude. I could do so much with porn chicks. <laughs> what if I could program them to actually enjoy everything, right? What if I could or, you know, program it to where while they're getting fucked, even if they don't normally get orgasm when they're getting fucked, they can get, they can actually orgasm. Less faking it without instead of faking it. Less Wouldn't acting required. Ads? Less acting required. <laughs> By the way, they're more pleasant and everything. My mentor, whenever I went to Vegas, was telling me the story of this guy uh, who he had mentored. And his whole thing is conditioning with pleasure for total transformation of the individual. He likes to take women and make them fully orgasmic, free from emotional pain, so they can fully embody the feminine in all aspects of their life. Right. So he taught this guy, and this guy decided to work with strippers. So he trains strippers, right? To become fully orgasmic, free from emotional pain, yada, 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 right? So as they were driving, driving to the club, they'd be putting on their stripper persona. When they got to the club, they were loving working there, right? They got along with everybody else great. They're incredibly great at interacting with all the people. They were really on point and everything else, right? And oh, by the way, since this is a conditioning with pleasure thing, you know, he talked about how, you know, when one of the girls would get off stage, she'd go to the bar, she'd start counting out the dollar bills. And when that last dollar bill hit, boom, she'd have an orgasm. <laughs> the bigger the stack, the bigger the orgasm. That's an incredibly motivating thing to get you to earn more tips on stage. That's beautiful. All right. And this guy got so got to the point where he's like, why the fuck am I doing? So he bought a few strip clubs and would only let girls that worked there that he had trained. Mm. So he has these entire places full of highly motivated women who are incredibly sexy, who incredibly fucking love their job, who all get along great, who are phenomenal with the customers, who are incredibly like dedicated to making a fuckload of money. Wait a minute. This guy's name wouldn't happen to be uh, Eric, would it? I don't know. All I know is that he passed away not too long ago. Oh, oh, different. Okay, I'm thinking of, then that's not the person I'm thinking of. I'm thinking okay. of a completely different person who, who works with strippers and is a hypnotist. Uh, wouldn't be surprised if he's, if he's trained by the same guy I'm talking about, though. Yeah, it wouldn't be. Wouldn't shock but, yes. Yeah. Uh, so there you go. Some of the cool things you can do with hypnosis. Uh, Danny Arnold, uh, mm -hmm. you kind of you did kind of touch on this already, but I'll just make sure you you touched mm -hmm. on it for Danny. Uh, he wonders, can hypnosis be a way to restore alpha mindset and behavior in guys? Fundamentally, yes. The re so I cannot hypnotically program you to be alpha. What I can do is get you the fuck out of your own way, so that you can do the shit you already know you should be doing. Hmm. All right. Fundamentally, what happens when somebody loses their edge, right? or they're not able to fully implement the red pill understandings that they have, right? Is that there is something inside them that's holding them back from implementing that. Whether they don't deserve to have those things, whether they are ashamed of it in some way, shape or form. Uh, I had one guy, one guy I did a session for who was having trouble uh, with cold approach during the day, right? He's walking through the park, good looking Irish guy, has that like whole fucking Irish smile on the bright eyes and the whole shit. And I want to fucking strangle this guy that he wasn't getting laid. But he'd be walking through the park and these girls would be looking at him, you know, beautiful women looking at him, giving him every single indicator of interest. And he'd look down, look away and walk off. He's like, what the fuck am I doing? Well, it turns out that he grew up in a, uh, shall we say, lower class Irish neighborhood. 
you know, the, the trailer park train wreck kind of scenario, right? Total shit upbringing. Now uh, he'd done about three, four years of therapy to kind of get over that sort of stuff. But there was a part of himself that fundamentally believed that he was broken, that because of the stuff that he was doing, they had been through, he was fundamentally broken and therefore didn't deserve good things in his life. Hmm. So he could be in a relationship with a woman as long as she was a train wreck. Wow. Right? Just got out of a seven year relationship with a BDPD check, right? He's allowed to have a job, but he wasn't able to have, you know, really let himself succeed. Right. So talked with him a bit and kind of ran on the scenario. It's like, well, you know, people that have broken their legs, right? It's like, well, yeah, it hurts like a motherfucker. And then you're giving around a cast for a long time. Right. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you look like a moron. Yeah. Yeah. But eventually you get good enough that you can set the crutches aside. And then eventually you get good enough. You get to take the cast off. Right. And it's like, well, yeah, you got to be tender with it because it still kind of hurts. Right. But eventually, you know, you're running around, you do exercises and you're good as new. If not better than before. Right. It's like, well, yeah. It's like, okay, cool. So you were broken back then, right? Well, yeah, yeah, I was broken. Um, and then you did all this work in therapy, right? Yeah, and you did all this work today, right? Yeah, and so you've let go of all that crap, right? Yeah, so you've healed yourself, right? Well, well, yeah. Well, if you're healed, then you're no longer broken, are you? It's like, well, no. It's like, well, if you're not broken anymore, then you deserve good things, right? Well, yeah. Go forth and be brilliant, right? So I don't necessarily know why you're holding yourself back from those things that you want to do or the behaviors you want to manifest. But what I can say is we can get back into the back of your head, figure out what that is, unfuck it, and let you go on your way. Uh, Danny also dropped the $5 super chat. Thank you very much, Danny. Asking how he can become a client of yours. Uh, Wonderful. So my website is hypnosisformen.net. Uh, you can go ahead and click on the button there to, to book a session with me. It'll take you directly to my, my booking calendar. Uh, if you'd like to sit down and have a conversation with me first, I can offer a 15-minute conversation to anybody. There's a book a call button on that top of my webpage as well. Uh, my calendar is there as well. Um, or you can just reach out to me via email. My email is ryan at hypnosisformen.net. I will get the dot com address one of these days, but it's like seven grand. So help me <laughs> help you make it easier on you. <laughs> the, uh, the link is now in the chat as well. Uh, Wonderful. Uh, the ne- so thank you for that, Danny. The uh, next question you, again, you kind of touched on this, but just to clarify, mm-hmm. uh, but ask what if you don't know the specific particular issues in your childhood does hypnosis reveal them if you're willing to follow the process yes as long as you're willing to go there yeah i had a session with a guy uh, a couple weeks back and he was just like not letting himself succeed and so forth and so on we went back to this moment where he very vividly remembered like the first couple of days after he was born and he had been born by cesarean cesarean uh, c-section uh, been born right on time, but for whatever reason, his lungs hadn't fully developed. So they took him out. He couldn't fucking breathe. He was in the NICU for like weeks, right? And he very clearly remembered the doctor saying that it would be a miracle if he made it through the night, that first day he was born, right? And as a result, he had this very real, very powerful feeling that he did not fucking belong in this world, that he wasn't supposed to be here, right? So that kind of undergirded his entire self-image right that he wasn't supposed to be here didn't fucking deserve to be here wasn't supposed to, it was wrong that he was here right so we had to unfuck that and fundamentally you remember everything that's happened to you in your life it's all stuck in the back of your head you just can't necessarily consciously access it they've actually done experiments where they had people who are under full anesthesia go into surgery room bring them out and a couple of days later they'd hypnotize them and these people could perfectly recall everybody that was in the room everything that was going on all the conversations that were happening because your ears don't stop getting that input. Your brain doesn't stop processing it. You're just in an anesthesia, so you're not consciously aware of it, right? But it's still happening. Your brain's still processing it, right? So you can remember stuff you wouldn't even imagine. It's unbelievable. Wow. As long as you're willing to go along with the process, yeah, we can get that. We can get that sort of stuff up. And the other thing is that we're often very rarely uh, you know, consciously aware of what's holding us back. We can see the shape. Of, we can tell what we're fucking doing. We can have some idea what might have happened in the past that might have happened, you know, might have brought it. But I can say that just about every single person who's come to me and said, I've got this problem and this is where I think it came from, those were not the event events in their life that we visited when we got once we got in them in, in hypnosis. And the mm-hmm. answers that we got while we we're there were not the ones we ex- he expected. Wow. I think that's that's something that's pretty uh eye opening. Is that you're not you're not you're nowhere near as aware of your unconscious self as you think you are. Oh, God, no. Not even close. Not even close. Uh, C. Joel's asks, I'm curious uh, what Ryan would say are some of the most common 
mental blocks found with guys that have girl problems. All right. So I would say that, God, what are the most common ones? Um, number one, a belief that you don't deserve it for whatever reason, right? You're not good enough. Uh, there's something fundamentally wrong with you or broken with you. That's a big one. Um, what are other ones? Uh, the fact that the idea that it's bad or wrong. Um, some guys have spent a situation where when they've grown up in rough, you know, abusive households where their father was abusive to their mother, where they think that they are fundamentally dangerous to them. Right. So they're protecting the women and their life from themselves. Right. Mm. Mm. Um, those I think would be the most, most, most common ones. It's not, I wouldn't necessarily put it down to bad parenting per se. It's just that you don't learn the right lessons and you don't see the world clearly as you're growing up. Mm. Right. Most people don't. And unfortunately, because we don't consciously choose what meaning our unconscious mind assigns to the different events in our life, and because we can't get back there on a regular basis to examine that. And oh, by the way, our unconscious mind doesn't bother showing us that shit either. either. It's very difficult to understand what's going on back there, very difficult to see it, and very difficult to change it without a lot of serious work, right? But that's why you guys, you got guys like me. There we go. Uh, Austin asked a good question. Uh, mm -hmm. Are some people unable to be hypnotized? Good question. Um, I would say there are some psychological disorders like psychosis and schizophrenia, dementia, Alzheimer's, that kind of thing. That's definitely a no-no. Uh, if you have an IQ under 70, probably very difficult. Uh, kids that are too young, very difficult. Uh, one thing that one of my mentors said is that if you're in the grip of a paralytic fear, you're not able to like guys, you know, there's a couple guys I worked with that are incredibly, incredibly anxious, like massive, like high anxiety all the fucking time. Those guys have an incredibly difficult time letting go hmm. and letting themselves go into hypnosis. Um, fundamentally, if you don't want to be hypnotized, I can't do it to you. If you refuse to cooperate the process, I can't make you do it. If you're in hypnosis, you can bring yourself out of hypnosis at any time, right? And if there's something that I tell you while you're in hypnosis that you fundamentally object to, you just will ignore it, reject it automatically, right? So I can't make you do anything you don't want to do. That said, if you've got a decent imagination, got an IQ over 70, which you probably do because you're here and you're typing on the internet, uh, you're not so anxious you can't let go and you don't have one of those major psychological disorders, then fundamentally, yes, you can be hypnotized. There is a variance in different uh, suggestibility, right? How quickly and how powerfully you respond to hypnosis. But if you are on that side of the spectrum that doesn't respond very powerfully or quickly, that's fine. I just hypnotize the ever living shit out of you until you do. <laughs> Good answer. It's like it's kind of like it's kind of like that old phrase about brute force, right? If brute force doesn't work, you're not using enough brute force. <laughs> if you're not very hypnotized, I just need to hypnotize you some more. <laughs> I like that. All right. Uh, Bert with a follow up question. He says, It seems like these uh, self limiting beliefs are so small and insignificant. How come they have such a powerful effect over us? Because of a couple of different things. Number one, they're not ones that you choose. Your unconscious mind is the one that chooses it for you, right? Mm -hmm. So it can be hard to let that go. There's something, there's a principle in hypnosis we call the critical factor. Uh, which is something, it's kind of like an abstraction of the barrier between your conscious and your unconscious mind, all right? And what that principle says is that your unconscious mind will simply refuse to accept anything that's too different from what it already believes. Mm -hmm. So if it believes that you're not worthy, standing in front of the mirror and saying you're awesome 150 times has no effect, right? That's why a lot of times you have to have that traumatic event to cause that neuroplasticity to bump so you can actually get back and change that shit again, all right? The other thing I'll say is that your unconscious mind is driving 90% plus of the things you're doing in life. Mm. I'm not consciously thinking about the words I'm going to say or how to, how to form things. I'm just talking, right? When you're driving a car, you're not thinking about how to drive, you know, move the steering wheel and everything else, right? If you look at the, con uh, the, the competency ladder, you go from unconscious incompetence to conscious incompetence to conscious competence to unconscious competence, right? 
you're mostly operating in that unconscious sphere, which means that it gets first crack at everything you do. And oh, by the way, your conscious mind receives all of its input from your unconscious mind. So all that sensory input that you get from the world around you gets filtered and processed by your unconscious mind before it presents the world to your conscious mind to act with. All right. Mm -hmm. Scott Adams did this periscope where he's talking about affirmations. And one of the things that he was talking about was this experiment where they took a group of people, they divided them up into people who considered themselves lucky and to people who considered themselves unlucky. All right. And they gave him this article. They said, just count the number of words in the article and they timed it. Well, the people that considered themselves unlucky took like 10 minutes to count the number of words in the article. And the guys who were considered themselves lucky took like two minutes. Well, it turns out that on the second page of the article in the top paragraph in very bold letters in the middle of it said, you can stop counting. There are 894 words in this essay. All right. The people who consider themselves lucky had that unconscious belief that they were lucky. So their mind was always on the lookout for those coincidences, those shortcuts, those serendipitous moments that would get them a better result. All right. So they saw those words, recognized the importance, stopped fucking counting, broke down the answer, and they were done. Mm. The people who considered themselves unlucky had that unconscious belief that they didn't have those things in their life, that stuff like that didn't happen to them. Right. So they saw those words, read them, kept on counting. <laughs> they didn't understand the significance of what those big fat words were fucking saying. Right. Because they're unconscious, they had that unconscious belief that they were unlucky. So their unconscious mind simply didn't allow them to take advantage of that opportunity that was right in front of their fucking face. Mm. Right. And that happens all the damn time because your unconscious mind is the one that presents the world to your conscious mind for action. It's going to show the conscious mind what it believes the conscious mind wants. So if you have this belief that you're unlucky, it's going to make sure that you miss all those opportunities out there. If you have an unconscious belief that you're lucky, it's going to show them all to you so that you can take action on it, right? Mm -hmm. That's why little things like that are so fucking powerful because our unconscious mind controls how our conscious mind sees the world, what we're allowed to act on, what we're not allowed on, to act on. Makes sense? Fantastic, fantastic stuff, Ryan. I'm loving this. Um, a bit of a, light, a more lighthearted question. Jordan mm -hmm. Gossett asks, would you agree that movies like Get Out have given hypnotherapy a terrible reputation? That and all the mesmerism stuff and all the look into my eyes and look into the swing you watch and all that sort of stuff. Like, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. What about, what about stage, a, stage hypnotists? Have they given it a bad rep? I think in some degree, yes, because it makes it seem just like entertainment, right? Like a parlor trick. Now, the cool thing about, yeah, like a parlor trick, right? Like it's all fun and games. It doesn't have any serious, serious thing, right? It makes it look ridiculous in a lot of ways. Mm. On the other hand, you can do some really, you can see them do some really cool shit in stage hypnosis, like making you forget the number six and have you count the fingers on your hands, like one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. <laughs> and be really fucking confused why all of a sudden you have 11 fingers on your hands, right? Mm. They can demonstrate a really a lot of really cool things that you can do with hypnosis, like negative hallucination, positive hallucination, making yourself in, you know, assuming different personas, like making yourself as stiff as a board to where they could like suspend you between two chairs perfectly rigidly, even though you're fucking stick in your matchstick and normally you wouldn't have that kind of strength, right? Do all those kinds of things. But because this is an entertainment thing, people assume that it doesn't have any real value or they assume mm -hmm. it's just parlor tricks and stuff like that, right? Also, I think that there's a, it gets a bad rap because all of the people that are considered serious mental health professionals get psychology degrees and social work degrees. And you don't really do that kind of stuff. You don't really explore hypnosis very much in those fields. Mm. So the professionals don't use this thing very much. So yeah. obviously it can't have any credibility. I mean, we all, have, we all have credible four year degrees are. I mean, my, well, my, uh, 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 these my, are PhDs, my, my friend. My pygmy uh, transgendered uh, Muslim studies degree that cost me oh, yeah. 60 grand. Truly important. Grand. I get it. It's just so, so useful in the uh, real world. Sure. But we're not talking about those shitty degrees. We're talking about a full 360 degree, 360 grand for an actual doctorate, my friend. You yes. got letters after your name after that thing. That, that very, means something. That means they, they, <laughs> they use more ink on your envelopes. Yes. 100%. 100%. So, that's another factor. And last but not least, a lot of the people who are involved in the hypnosis world are also in that like power of positive thinking crystals and woo woo shit. Yeah. Right. Which, so you've got this entire crew of people who are 
quite frankly, a little bit off the fucking rocker. They're like, oh, hypnosis is magical and you can do anything in hypnosis and it's all about motivation and I just have to snap my fingers and your life changes in an instant. Yeah. And there's part of me going, bullshit. Because it's an incredibly powerful tool and you can do all kinds of cool shit. And you don't have to say that kind of crap to convey the value of these kinds of techniques. Yes, yes. I'm glad you touched on that. Yeah, because there's, there's a lot of like people would, I know there's, there's, there, there'll be people who watch, who look at the word hypnotherapist in the title of this video and they'll think mm -hmm. woo woo. They'll instantly think woo woo. Like we're talking about fucking crystals oh, yeah. and chakras and, and you're going to, you just, but you're going to manifest a Ferrari in your driveway just by thinking about it and not taking any action at all. Uh, I'll tell you what, the very first video on my YouTube channel that I made was a response to a guy by the name of Marcel Klein. He's a hypnotist in California that did an interview with John Sumnez from Bulldog Mindset. And I saw that thing and I was pissed and it took me a couple of days to figure out all the reasons why. So I made like a 20 minute video about why I think his approach to hypnosis was bullshit and what I hated about his approach. Cause he's one of these guys who's out in California, change your life in an instant, snapping my fingers, all about motivation. You're be just, you know, it's like driving around Lambos, dating Victoria's secret models, right? Young guy in his twenties and stuff like that. And it just drove me up the fucking wall. So if you want to see, if you want to understand what I think about guys like that, go to my YouTube channel, watch my thoughts on Marcel Klein, right? Yeah. But fundamentally, right? Like it's, you don't have to do that. It's the success porn version of hypnosis, right? It's the woo woo energy crystals, suntanning your asshole version of hypnosis. And you don't fucking have to do that. <laughs> you just don't have to go there. Uh, uh, we've got two questions here. We might, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I think we'll finish on these last two questions because we're coming up on, on almost two hours. Uh, so we will have what to are you, we'll keep on going. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I got to shoot early in the morning. <laughs> uh, fair enough, fair enough. So you actually have to do work in the morning. Yes. So uh, right. they, they feel quite uh, kind of related. So Bert asks, mm -hmm. can you do a hypnosis session over the internet or do you have to be in person? And then Jordan uh, follows up with, do you think hypnosis over a Zoom call makes people more likely to be open with you because they're not physically present? All right. So to answer the first question, yes. Every single therapeutic session of hypnosis I have ever done in my entire career has been over Zoom because I got started in the middle of fucking COVID. <laughs> so I've actually never had any in-person hypnosis sessions for, for therapeutic reasons for clients. I've done some with my girlfriend. I've done some during, uh, during, you know, training and stuff like that. Um, but I've never actually had to do a, hypno a hypnotherapy session with a client in person. It's all been done over Zoom and it works just fine because fundamentally all I really need to do to get you in hypnosis is talk to you in a certain tone of voice and get you to focus on the sound of my voice while you begin to relax. And as long as you're willing to do the things I tell you to do, then you're going to be able to get exactly where we need to get. And you're going to get exactly the kinds of results you want to have. All right. Does it make it easier for people to open up over Skype or over zoom because I'm not physically present? Man, that's a hard question to ask. I think it is easier to build rapport with somebody when you're in the same room with them, right? When I can reach out and touch your shoulder, when you're having a hard time, when we actually get to see all those body uh, body language cues, right? When you actually get to have that sense of somebody face-to-face -face and in person, I think that's a much more powerful connection. Mm. I think it's up to, and I think quite frankly, once you're in hypnosis, once you're willing to go there, and allow that process to happen, understanding that whatever comes up, you can handle. Whatever comes out, we can handle together. Because I've had guys have massive emotional traumatic shit come up in the middle of a session that we've had to deal with. You know, that we've had to help this guy get over the stuff, release all this traumatic bullshit, release all this energy, and then get back in the session and keep doing the work, right? Once you realize that if you're willing to put your your faith in me to lead you through this, that we're going to get you where you want to be, I think you can get to wherever you need to. All right, whether that's in person over a Zoom call, doesn't matter. There you go, gentlemen. Book yourself a session with Ryan Christensen if you find that there's any of these, uh, you know, if anything that Ryan has touched on today, you think uh, might be affecting you. I think. There, but trust me, there has been a, a quite a large number of men who are already benefiting from his services. Uh, very quickly, Austin, thank you very much for the $10 super chat. Much appreciated. Uh, 
drop your uh yeah i was just just gonna say drop your uh, uh your website link your youtube channel link and your uh contact info in the chat but you just did it yeah yeah so www.hypnosisformen.net you can book a session you can book a call for me to do a quick consultation with you if you'd like reach out to me ryan at hypnosisformen.net follow me on youtube i link my youtube channel on there subscribe i am going to be putting out more content now that i don't have a full-time job and i'm recovering from surgery i'm also hypnosis for men on twitter and instagram so follow me there to get all these live updates uh and all this live streaming we'll be doing i've got an interview coming up with Afi Kingdom, I believe next week. I've also got an interview with Red Sings the Blues uh, on the 1st of November, so you'll get notified for those, for more content like this, and once in the chat for Sterling for being an amazing fucking interviewer and having this amazing time. Thank you, Ryan. Much appreciated. You're quite welcome. And don't forget, smash the like button if you're still watching, or even if you're watching mm -hmm. on the replay, smash it. It helps it show up in everybody's uh, feed and subscribe. And click the notification bell so you can get notified when I go live. I go live every day at the moment. So make mm -hmm. sure you your feed and then you can jump in the live chat and we can ask uh, answer any of the questions you have. It also, I found it also helps if you download the YouTube app on your phone uh, and you subscribe and hit, click the notification bell, it'll always show up and give you a ping when I go live on your phone. Yep. So it's a much easier way. Definitely hit your, yeah, definitely hit the notification bell guys and select all instead of personalized because YouTube will not automatically notify you if you're subscribed until it actually starts getting some traction. So hit that all button on the notification bell. Do that to help them out. Exactly. Danny Arnold, uh, where'd you go? Well, Sammy, phenomenal interview. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, uh, where we go, Danny. So glad I joined this cult, Sterling. <laughs> this is not a cult. And Osama bin chicken confirms that the bin chicken, uh, the, the league of extraordinary bin chickens is not a cult, uh, but you're all welcome. You're all very, very welcome. Awesome. Thank you, gentlemen. That'll be it for tonight. Uh, check out Ryan's stuff, please. He is fantastic. Uh, we're definitely going to, I'm definitely having him back on this show again, because this was just outstanding. This is brilliant. And I, well, what I'd love to do, what I'd love to do, Ryan, is I'd, I want to, want to interview my buddy, um, my, this Australian guy I was telling you about, and I've actually, because a couple of doms, in my industry that I want to interview on this mm -hmm. channel, particularly in particularly James Mogul, the guy who trained me, who created the training of O for kink.com. Ah, yes. I remember Simon was talking about him. Yeah. He's he was a good mentor. interview. He was my, my mentor. And right now he's actually posting all of his, uh, on his Twitter account, he's posting all the planning notes for the world building that he did. You mentioned that it's fascinating. So I'd love to try and get him on this, uh, on the show. And then I also want, and what I would love to do after that is get all of you guys, together for a oh, live that'd be a good one that'd because be a lot of fun that would be a ton of fun so that's that's what i've got planned in the future uh outstanding tomorrow night i don't have a guest scheduled in yet uh saturday night the plan is uh for me to interview porn star destiny cruise tune in for that one and sunday nice. night i'm going to be interviewing uh paul benjamin from apex mindset so that's going to be an excellent one guys tune in for that one uh he definitely knows his shit dude his harem game is Tight. It's on. He's got the be he's got my ideal relationship, and I kind of fucking hate him for it. Also, <laughs> he's a master hypnotist and master NLP practitioner, and uses that kind of stuff in his relationship. So be sure to ask him about that, Sterling. I will. I actually didn't know that, so I'm going to make a note to oh, actually. Yes. Ask Thank you very much. All right, lads. You're welcome. Play some play some music, and we'll get out of here. All right. You all have a Cheers. good night. That was a good job, man. Good times. Thank you, sir. That was a fantastic.